and the glory forever. Amen. I don't know why that I like certain words. Uh, maybe as a bit of a wordsmith, I like certain words like proclivity and propensity and penchant, which all basically mean the same thing. But I also like the word preclude. But I'm not, I'm not married to just words that start with P. I don't know why I like the word druthers. I don't know why. I just like the word druthers. Well, if I had my druthers. Have you ever said that? If I had my druthers. It's kind of unique to North America, and it's kind of informal speech, but I just like the word druthers. And lately, I've got to tell you, God hasn't always been giving me my druthers, my preferences. In fact, not too many weeks ago, as I lay in the hospital, now I was out of ICU, which was, I was thankful for. But I'm now up on third floor of the cardiac unit, and I am really struggling with AFib. And most of the time, it's real manageable. I told the nurses, when it's manageable, I could sleep. When it's manageable, it's sort of like, you know, you can feel, I could feel it if I concentrated that my heart was a little irregular. But it's sort of like if I were to use a musical instrument, it's a piccolo inside. But for two nights and parts of three days, I battled a type of AFib that was not very manageable. And I couldn't sleep, so I got no, basically no sleep at night. I'm getting exhausted, and I described it to the nurses. This is not a piccolo. This is like if I had a tuba inside me, I could feel it through my back when I would lie in bed, and it's irregular. So it's boom, 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 boom all the time. And I could even feel my body kind of shaking with the irregularity of the heart. And so by after that second night, I have a come to Jesus meeting with Jesus. Sometimes I have a come to Jesus meeting with people, other people, but I had a come to Jesus meeting with Jesus. And I got to tell you, I was getting a little angry. I don't get angry with God much, but I was getting angry. And by this time, of course, I'm up in my other room, the third floor, and I can have the door closed. I have a little bit of privacy. So I'm walking in my room back and forth, and I'm complaining. And I'm telling God, and it's sounding kind of like this. I know as a pastor, you're probably not supposed to say this, but this is what I was saying, and this is a, at least close and a paraphrase of what I was saying. I said, listen, I have been speaking to this mountain of this AFib, and I'm getting nowhere. I mean, I can't go on like this. And so I, I'm just, I'm going to let you know that all this stuff about speaking to the mountain, I'm not going to preach that anymore. If I can't get better, I'm not going to preach that anymore. And that stuff you told the disciples when you got up and rebuked the wind and you said, where was your littleness of faith implying to them, I'm, I'm saying all this, implying to them that they should have spoken to the storm, What's this about? I'm speaking to AFib over and over, and I'm getting nowhere. And I'm going to let you know, I, I love you, and I, I trust you. But basically, in Boatman paraphrase, I was saying, I love you, but I don't like you very much right now. That was my word to God, and then God was just silent. Ah, just silent. And then, rather suddenly, this word came. And it was from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. I felt a little bit like just a small, small fraction of Job, like, oh. I've been doing all this ranting, all this complaining, feeling mad at God. And then God begins to expound this word and that began to change and reshape my heart. How I thought about not getting my druthers in just a fraction, a fraction of what we see in the Bible narratives, people like Job and people like Paul who wrote that verse. So in the days following and the weeks following, this has taken on new meaning for me because this is what God was speaking. Paul said, the, extra, the extraordinary level of the revelations I've received is no reason for anyone to exalt me. Well, the revelations he had received, he had gone through to the, to the Corinthian church 
all this, all this stuff that he had suffered, which was a huge amount. It was an amazing vessel of God. But then he told them about the revelation he had received, and he spoke of it in the third person, but all scholars agree he's talking about himself. And he said there was such a man who was, who was taken to the third heaven or paradise. He said, I don't know if he was in the body or out of the body. So in other words, Paul's experience was so intense, he didn't know if he had his body with him there or not. But the glory was so intense the magnitude of God's presence so incredible, he could not articulate such Shekinah, such glory to the people he was writing. He didn't know how to to express it. That was the kind of glory he was caught up into, these revelations of, of the Christ and of our place in the body of Christ. So because of these revelations, he said, for this is why a thorn in my flesh was given, sometimes translated, Allowed, I was allowed to receive this, but a thorn in my flesh was given to me, the adversary's messenger, Satan's messenger sent to harass me, sometimes translated to, to buffet me or to torment me, blow after blow after blow after blow. A thorn in my flesh was given. So what is that thorn in the flesh? Well, I'm not going to clear that one up today, uh, but there are a couple main thoughts on it. One, some people believe it was a physical condition, perhaps an eye condition, that dates back to his conversion. Remember when he's in broad daylight, basically he's knocked down and he's blinded by Jesus. And then when Ananias went to pray for him, scales fell from his eyes. So some people believe that it was an ongoing physical eye problem that Paul had, maybe. I don't think so because he doesn't really reference it any other time other than a subtle reference as far as um, seeing how large of letters I've written to you. Maybe, maybe a kind of a mask reference. But what I think is more likely and what I think is the sentiment of a lot of, of, of Bible teachers and scholars is that Paul's talking about the Judaizers, those Jewish people, formerly colleagues, who disagree with Paul's proclamation of Jesus. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. So they follow him. Not only do they, re- do they rebel in the given towns or around the Mediterranean basin where he travels, but they follow him and they, they cause riots wherever he goes or many places where he goes. And so Paul is beaten and he's imprisoned and all of this stuff because people don't like what he's saying. Or for some people, they have prism brains. And so what he says goes into their brain, but then it takes an angle here and there. They're not hearing what he says. And so he's constantly plagued by this group of, of people. And in addition to that, he's plagued as, as his message disrupts the economy in different cities like Ephesus and Philippi, where in Philippi he exercises a demon from a young lady who's being used as a psychic And her owners instantly know they lose their revenue because of this. So they end up in prison over that one. And of course he's writing, he writes later to the Philippians from from prison. And then in Ephesus, uh, the economy is just starting to shut down because people are getting so on fire for Jesus that they're bringing all their stuff on witchcraft and sorcery and they burn it like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of stuff, and they're no longer buying the gods and the goddesses, and so the people who make those things don't like that, and so they get Paul in trouble. So those are the kinds of things that probably, I think, the thorn in the flesh, over and over and over, wherever he travels, he has to endure this, he is beaten, he is imprisoned, he's treated unjustly, over and over and over. It makes anything I would ever go through in my life seem just about that big, like the size of a a grain of sand. But that's what he went through. And, And he went through it again and again and again. The thorn in the flesh was given to me. The adversary, the Satan's messenger, sent to harass me, keeping me from becoming arrogant. Now here's what gets me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to relieve me of this. Now this is, this is a big gun in the church. Paul. I mean, he's the one miracles have followed him over and over. He writes nearly two-thirds of the New Testament. And 
He's pleading with God, and he pleads with God three times, and evidently God's not giving him his druthers. Evidently he's not getting what he's praying for. So I'm not alone. And if you've ever prayed, and the prayer doesn't seem to be answered like you want, you're not alone. And then we see this. This is in the, uh, the Passion Translation. Uh, the the uh, New American Standard that I use personal study uh, Bible most of the time, it says, my grace is sufficient for you, for, for my power is perfected in weakness. But this is the Passion Translation, um, beginning with verse 9. This is the broader context of what I shared. But he answered, oops, but he answered, me, my grace is always more than enough for you. I like that. I like the word sufficient also, but I like this more than enough. And I think, especially for Jewish readers, they have an instant connection to what Paul is talking about because of Abraham and Sarah, actually Abram and Sarai at this point. Because in Genesis chapter 17, Abram has waited 25 years. Sarai has waited 25 years for God to fulfill this promise of a child. But so far, he's not given them their druthers. And so, finally, Sarah says, well, and this was common in that culture, she says, take my handmaiden, Hagar, have a child with her, and that will be our, our uh, child. So Abram did that. Hagar has a child, Ishmael. And then Sarah says, what were you thinking? And Abram says, I'm just doing what you told me to do. Yeah, I've heard that before. So there were really problems between Abram and Sarai over this, right? So then, then, these 25 years later, God speaks to Abram. And he says, I am El Shaddai. You know the song we sometimes sing, El Shaddai? He says, I am El Shaddai. And El Shaddai means, I am the all-sufficient one, or I am the God who is more than enough for you. Hallelujah. So he changes Abram's name to Abraham. He takes a Y, an H rather, out of the name Yahweh, the name for God, the most sacred name for God. He takes an H out of his name and makes Abram Abraham. He takes another H out of his name and makes Sarah, Sarah Sarai rather, Sarah. And when all this is done, Abraham falls to the ground and the Bible says he laughs. He's laughing quietly because he knows God can't hear you when you laugh quietly. But he's laughing because he's thinking, this is ridiculous. You've waited till I'm 100 years old? No way. I'm not getting my brothers now. And God said, it's going to happen. Later, when God uh, shows up uh, through three visitors and tells Sarah the same thing, Sarah laughs. And the angel said, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah denied it. But he said, no, you laugh. But a year from now, you're going to have a little one in your arms. So that's what happens. And then finally, they do have Isaac. And Isaac's name means laughter. You're going to laugh at my plan? I'm going to give you a child. and You're going to call him laughter. Because I am always the God who is more than enough for you, even when you don't think you're getting your druthers. And my power finds its full expression through your weakness. Now think about that for a minute. He's going to expound on that. But my power finds its full expression through your weakness. I'm not sure I like that, but that's the way God works. So I will celebrate, Paul says, my weaknesses. Have you ever thought of doing that? Instead of complaining about your weaknesses or the way things didn't turn out, to actually celebrate them because you're celebrating it from a position of weakness, that I can't control this. There's nothing here. I can only control the controllables, but so much of what's happening, I can't control. And so I'm going to celebrate in the midst of my weaknesses. For when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. And I love this. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Just say that to yourself. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Praise God. Well, for me... As God began to expound some of this stuff to me, 
I said, okay, I'm basically going to celebrate my weakness. I, I seem to have no ability to demonstrate uh, over this, this tuba-like AFib. I can't get sleep, so I've got to trust you that sleep deprivation uh, is not going to stop me. So God began to draw me into something that for lack of better phraseology, I'm going to call it deep centering. And that's what I've continued to call it uh, as I ponder that. He drew me to deep centering. I've centered for years, centered in Christ. But he was calling me to deep centering. And here's what that looked like as best I can describe it. Because I couldn't sleep, I would lie in bed, I would imagine that I'm docked, in, I'm in a boat that's docked on like a, a small lake or a pond or something. And you know how the waves move irregularly? Like when you're docked in a boat. Imagine lying down in a boat and you're docked in it, so the, the rope's holding you there, but the waves just sort of irregularly hit the boat. That was the tuba afib. So that was in my imagination. I was in a boat, and I was lying down on a bench, and my tuba afib replicated the movement of the water. Or I should say, in my imagination, the movement of the water replicated my tuba-like afib. And then, in the stern, I'm on this bench, and on the stern is Jesus lying there, resting as well. And I'm holding his hand. <laughs> and I, ex I exerted every ounce of my energy to imagine that. There I am in the boat with Jesus, holding his hand. And while, my, while the waves are hitting irregularly. And I'm not going to tell you that this was as good as sleep. But it revived me. And it renewed me. I held it there for a long time. Just every ounce of my energy in that deep century with that image of holding Jesus' hand while the boat is irregularly rocking in the water. He did it his way. He didn't do it the way I wanted it. But through it, he drew me to something deeper, realizing that even sleep is something he can get us through when we're not sleeping by drawing us close to his heart. So I'm learning something. And hey, I'm, I feel like I'm a beginner in all of this, but I'm learning something. Resting in God, loose ends and all. My life has lots of loose ends. What about yours? Resting in God, loose ends and all. I like movies that have definite plots and I like it when it brings closure at the end and the good people win and the bad people lose and the guy gets the girl and the family gets together don't you like those kind of movies I like that but when you have in your family a resident film critic who competes with global competitors on film trivia you're exposed to all different kinds of movies. So some of Caleb's favorite movies are not plot-based. He's not against those. But some of his favorite movies are dialogue-based movies. And a lot of times, they end what I would call with loose ends. They're up in the air. There's no closure here. So we'll watch a two-hour movie. And it's got great dialogue. And then it ends. And I'm saying, are you kidding me? This is it? This is it? I mean, I feel cheated. I don't know what happened. Did he get the girl? Did they get back together as a family? Does he get the job? What happens? Caleb said, that's the point. You don't know. And Caleb was saying to me, you know, life's messy. Well, I don't want life to be messy, right? That's not my druthers. I don't want a messy life. And yet that seems to be exactly what we're called to live in, in this world that is fallen, that is broken, that is fractured. So I'm learning in the midst of it, resting in God, loose ends and all. See, I like scripts where, where young fathers get healed. I like scripts where older gentlemen who love to trout fish walk out of a COVID situation and fish again. I like that in the scripts. 
where kids aren't caught in the crossfire of divorce, where teenagers don't take their lives. Those are the kind of scripts I want. But I'm in a world where other things happen, where there are lots and lots of loose ends. And what are some of your loose ends? What are some of the loose ends in, in your life? Like maybe for some it's, I don't know if I'm going to have enough money when I retire. For some it's, I don't know if I'm going to have enough money to get through this month. Or maybe you're awaiting a doctor's report that could be life-altering in your life. Or maybe you're wondering, will that, will that daughter or son be able to find a job in today's economy? Will they be able to pay for their college? You've got all these questions and loose ends. Or maybe you're thinking, you know, am I ever going to have a fulfilling relationship? But is that ever going to happen to me? Will I ever get my druthers with that? And it's learning to rest in God, loose ends, and all. There was this guy, this prophet named Elijah, and he got kind of accustomed, I think, to the miraculous, and he called the prophet of power, sometimes called the prophet of fire. And Elijah uh, sometimes had to live it pretty roughly, but God always came through in this miraculous way for him. And then suddenly, at, his, at the peak of his power, where he calls fire down from heaven and the prophets of Baal are defeated. He gets a memo from Jezebel telling him, by next day, at this time, you're going to be dead. And suddenly Elijah realizes there's no sense of God's presence. He's not feeling God. And he doesn't, even though he's a prophet, he doesn't know what to do. And so he flees for his life. And he runs, and now he's exhausted because that happens to us when we're running in fear. We eventually get exhausted fighting this fight. And now he wants to die, and he basically just goes to sleep, and the angel shows up and wakes him up, feeds him, lets him sleep again, feeds him, lets him sleep again, and then revives him and says, Listen, quit your whining, Boatman paraphrase, because there are 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone in this. I'm going to take you on a 40-day journey, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring you into a, a deeper level of centering, if you will. And so he goes on this 40-day journey to the Mount of God, and he's in a cave, and God comes to Elijah in three familiar ways, through fire, through wind, through an earthquake, powerful, dramatic things, but the Bible says God wasn't in any of them. And then, he comes to Elijah in the hush, the stillness of silence. And in the silence, God speaks. Elijah is learning a different way of relating to God that had he not gone through the pain of not getting his druthers, he would have never come to. Elijah was learning this resting in God loose ends and all. The Apostle Paul writes this from prison. And think about this. He's chained to a guard. His, his movement is limited. And he doesn't have the freedom to go walk the Roman Forum if he wants. He's tied down. He can only control the controllables. He doesn't know if the whims of a Caesar, if he'll be dead the next day. He doesn't have a guarantee of how long his life will last. And he pens this. I eagerly expect and hope that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, in my life, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. This has taken on new meaning for me. We have no guarantees. Paul had no guarantee. He might be beheaded tomorrow. But today, whether by my life or by death, I want to exalt Jesus. Now, what about that for how we live our lives? However things turn out, whether I get my druthers or not, we live in such a way that I just want to exalt Him in my body, whether by life, if I'm given the gift of today, hallelujah, or by death, if He takes me home. Either way, I exalt Jesus 
in my body. For to me to live today, my focus, my deep center today is Christ. Everything else is peripheral. Everything else is on the margins. But to live is in my deep center with Christ. And to die is gain. So it used to be, uh, before September 18th of this year, that I would be on my five-mile walk, and oftentimes I would think, I'd like to be doing this into my 90s. And then a triple bypass and a week of humbling later. And I'm just thankful for today. I don't know. Every, every day I'm out there. Right now I do four miles because I think we should do all things in moderation. But I'm on my four-mile walk, I'm just thanking God for the gift that I have today. And when I pray the Lord's Prayer, you know what I pray now when I come to that part, give us this day our daily bread? I mean, God knows I don't need money for a hamburger. I'm not going to starve in this country with my income. I don't need it for physical food. But what I pray is, Lord, give me today a regular heartbeat. Just a regular heartbeat today. And so far, it's been quite a while now. Uh, three or four weeks, regular, no AFib heartbeat. And I say, thank you, thank you. Because for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. I don't know about tomorrow because I don't know how long it ticks. It'd be great to live a long time, but I have today. And this day, I want to exalt in my body Christ. And if he takes me home, I want that to be an exaltation to Christ. So what are your loose ends? What are the druthers that haven't worked out that this week you're willing to say, Jesus, I've been a little ticked or I've been distant from you because my druthers haven't happened. But I'm going to trust you with my loose ends. And I have today, and I want to thank you for the gift of today. And help me to exalt in my body you, Jesus, today, and then when you take me home, help me to exalt you in that. Because you are the God who gives me rest in the midst of the loose ends of life when it doesn't work out according to script, at least my script. Can you rest in that? Can you rest in that? What God's going to do in our lives when we Welcome that. Resting in God. Loose ends and all. Let's pray together. Whether you're at home watching online or whether you're in this sanctuary in person, may God help us to draw more deeply into that centered place in Christ. And... May we learn from Paul and come a little bit closer to just being thankful for the gift we have today and desire with Paul to exalt Christ in our body, whether by life or by death. And may we celebrate even our weaknesses because in our weakness, his strength, his power is perfected. We give you praise, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the living Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise man.